Good evening. I'm Joshua Johnson. It's Thursday, June 30th, and here's what we're talking about tonight. A big Supreme Court term comes to a close with two final decisions, while its first black woman takes the oath and her place on the bench. President Biden says he supports ending the filibuster to preserve abortion rights. The thing is, it's not entirely up to him. Also, Russia suffers a major setback in Ukraine that could have implications beyond the war. And NASA wants a human presence at the moon by the end of this decade. More on its plan to get that done in part two of our feature report. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court ended a historic term with some major decisions. It was the last day of service for Justice Stephen Breyer after nearly 28 years on the bench. And it was day one for Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman on the Supreme Court. So help me God. So help me God. Now, on behalf of all of the members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. Justice Jackson's installation does not change the court's six to three conservative majority. That majority drove some consequential decisions this term. In Dobbs, the court ended the constitutional right to abortion by overturning Roe versus Wade. In New York State Rifle, it made it easier for Americans to carry guns in at least a half dozen states. Two cases addressed the separation of church and state. In Kennedy, justices ruled in favor of a public high school football coach who prayed on the field after games. In Carson, it allowed public money to pay for tuition at a religious school. And today, it ruled on West Virginia versus EPA, affecting the federal government's efforts to fight climate change. Let's begin tonight with NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams. And Pete, let's start with this EPA ruling. What is the scope of the ruling? A number of critics had said that this would affect more agencies beyond the EPA and more than the government's ability to fight climate change. But what does it actually mean? Well, it could potentially do that. The question here was whether the EPA had authority to restrict greenhouse gas emissions beyond just the boundary of a, a, each specific power plant. There's no question that Congress gave the Environmental Protection Agency the authority to control pollution. But the question here was, does the EPA have a broader authority to help the energy sector restructure by encouraging power companies to move more of their generation away from coal-fired power plants and towards solar and wind? And today the Supreme Court said the answer to that question is no. By a six to three vote, it said that that kind of a major change can only be done by an agency if it has explicit approval for Congress. The court calls this the major change doctrine. And it said the EPA didn't have that authority. Now, the dissenters disagreed. They said this is right in the EPA's wheelhouse and they had authority to do it. But that's why, Joshua, this has the seeds of potentially a broader uh, implications for other regulatory agencies because the court's principle would apply to any other other agency of government that if they don't have explicit authority from Congress to do something big, then the, the court might strike it down. It's, it's not self-executing. They're going to have to be individual lawsuits, but it does give the business community, for example, uh, more power to try to fight regulations in the future. This feels like this has a couple different tendrils. You just mentioned one in terms of business businesses being able to fight certain regulations. Obviously, agencies like this are only allowed to do what statutes allow them to do. There's also been right. this other political conversation in the last few years about the so-called administrative state and the limits of yeah. power on government grown amok. I don't want to read too much into the implications of this, but it's kind of hard to look at this ruling without thinking of all of that, too. Actually, I think you're reading just enough into it because that's really been the project of some of the conservatives like Neil Gorsuch. He wrote about this, for example, when he was still on the Tenth Circuit. The rule used to be that if there was ambiguity in a federal agency's rules and you didn't know whether it actually had the authority to do this or not, 
that you the tie sort of went to the runner, that the, you, you gave the benefit of the doubt to the agency because that's where the expertise was. And by the way, that is a Supreme Court ruling written by Justice Antonin Scalia. Justice Gorsuch and some of the other conservatives have never liked that. And so what you see in this EPA decision is their attempt to try to change that formula. With regard to the Remain in Mexico policy and the way the Supreme Court ruled, I have seen, I've seen an array of different headlines on this today. Some of them say that the court struck <laughs> the policy down. Some of them say the court gave the Biden administration latitude to change or strike down the policy. What did the court actually do and what was its rationale? So I would go for option uh, for, for, for door number two on that one. Uh, the Supreme Court basically, the, the question here was, did the Supreme Court take all the r proper regulatory steps, dotting the I's and crossing the T's to begin to end this program? There's no question that a president can launch a program like this, and no question that another president can take it away, but there's administrative steps that have to happen in either case, and the question here is whether the Biden administration went through all the steps properly, and the Supreme Court basically said today, so far, so good, uh, you may continue with your efforts to shut it down. So it's not over yet. It goes back down to the lower courts for, for some additional hearings, but so far the administration is on track to shut it down. But as of tonight, it's still in a Effect. The court also rejected a case about vaccine mandates in New York, a case that had to do with religious freedoms. What was the case there and what does rejecting that case mean? So this was uh, an appeal by healthcare workers in New York who were challenging the vaccine mandate for healthcare workers because it doesn't contain a religious exception. People that, would, that object to it on religious grounds, and those grounds are these people say that the stem cells, even though they were created decades ago, were nonetheless used in evaluating the, the efficacy of these vaccines, and therefore they don't want to have anything to do with them. The Supreme Court rejected their challenge, and so far it has had a pretty consistent record record of turning away these challenges when people say the vaccine mandate doesn't have a religious exception. It's done it for uh, special operations sailors, for students in Indiana, for healthcare workers in Massachusetts and New York and for others. So uh, the Supreme Court simply said we're not going to take the appeal. We're going to let the, uh, the law stay in effect. And before I let you go, now that Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is now Associate Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, <laughs> what are some of the cases that we expect she'll be dealing with as a member of the court next term? Well, we know what some of them are, and she'll have all summer to get prepared for them. So one of the big ones is affirmative action. Now, by the way, we don't know whether she'll vote on this or not. She said in her confirmation hearing that because she's on a board that advises Harvard, she may recuse herself from this case. This is the question of whether colleges can use, racial, uh, can use affirmative action in admissions. And she may, she may or may not be able to vote on that case. Uh, that's a case out of Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Another question is whether business owners can refuse to serve same-sex weddings uh, based on religious objections or whether that simply violates anti-discrimination laws. And then a couple of cases having to do with voting rights. How much authority do the states have in redistricting uh, to, to uh, gerrymander or change the district boundaries, to put it more neutrally, and take race into account? Uh, and the second one is the one the court just granted today, and it could have far-reaching implications for the coming presidential election. The court will decide whether state legislatures and not state courts have the final word on how elections are conducted for federal candidates. Republicans this case comes from North Carolina too. They say, well, the answer is legislatures. It's in the Constitution. It says the legislature shall choose the time, place, and manner of elections. That's how it's supposed to work. The opponents say, well, if the legislatures get the last word and the courts can't say whether, for example, that violates a state constitution, then the voters wouldn't have any place to go when their rights are threatened, Joshua. Pete, I'm going to be real bad and take 30 seconds that I don't have. Stephen Breyer, retired from the court today. I know we talk a lot about Justice Jackson joining. What is he taking with him? What is his legacy on the court now that he's leaving, briefly? Well, he's somebody who's uh, been, uh, of course, a proponent of affirmative action, but more than anything, somebody who believed that the law should, you should look at the practical consequences of a decision and not just look at history and not just look at the text, but look at the effect that a decision should have. And that's a view that some of the conservatives on the court don't share.
Thank you, Pete, for indulging me for an extra 30 seconds. That's NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams starting us off tonight from Washington. There is more fallout from this week's January 6th hearing. Yesterday, the committee subpoenaed former White House counsel Pat Cipollone. He came up a number of times during the testimony of former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson. She credited Mr. Cipollone with helping rein in President Trump in the months surrounding the election. I think that this is an instance where the presidency, the American people, where we've been through something we've never been through before and where there's a very real and significant chance that, you know, there, um, that there was behavior underway uh, about which Mr. Cipollone expressed significant legal concerns, uh, and I think he has an obligation to testify. President Biden is planning a major speech once the, once the investigation wraps up. Sources tell us it will highlight what is at stake if the former president or his allies return to power. Let's continue now with NBC senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. And John, if you could pick up where we heard Congresswoman Cheney leave off, kind of the connection between the testimony we heard on Tuesday and the committee's renewed desire to hear from Pat Cipollone. Yeah, it's a great question, Joshua. And I think the uh, real answer to that is this urgency that they feel uh, because of the explosiveness of this testimony, because of uh, the prospect of witness tampering that's going on. And of course, they've wanted to hear from Cipollone for a long time, uh, but I think they're trying to move up the pace of these discussions uh, with him and others who have been uh, reluctant to go on, on the record to go under oath. Uh, the same is true with the Secret Service agent. Cipollone, obviously, as the counsel to the president um, and involved in all of these meetings, or certainly many of these meetings has a perspective unlike anybody else who might testify. You mentioned the prospect of witness tampering or witness interference. That also came up in her conversation with ABC's Jonathan Carl. Here's more of what she said about that. Watch. Do you think some of the testimony you received wasn't truthful because people were threatened? The way that I would put it is that it gives us a real insight into how people around the former president are operating uh, into the extent to which they believe that they can affect the testimony of witnesses before the committee. Uh, and it's something we take very seriously. Um, and it's something that people should be aware of. It, it's a very serious issue. And I would imagine the Department of Justice uh, would be very interested in and would take that very seriously as well. John, there have been other hearings on Capitol Hill that involve the president where we know, because the witnesses told us, that the president was commenting on them as they were sitting there. So he was kind of present in the room at the time. Clearly, the committee has no tolerance for this, but now the stakes are way, way higher. Well, and we've also watched it in public, Joshua. We watched the president, then President Trump, tweet at people who were uh, the subject of investigations, at, who, who were uh, testifying during the first Ukraine hearing. He was tweeting about what was going up and on, about the testimony that was there. I mean, it could not have been more clear that he was looking over uh, the shoulders of people who worked for him. And so uh, this is a pattern of behavior that uh, we've seen before. And of course, uh, the committee has not yet said who those uh, text messages were sent to and from and uh, who was the, the object of them. But the uh, implication from Congresswoman Cheney just there is that, uh, in fact, the committee believes that former President Trump is attempting to tamper with witnesses here. And of course, that would, uh, as she said, be something of interest to the Justice Department. One more thing about Congresswoman Cheney. She was in California, as you could probably tell from that backdrop, to speak at the Reagan Presidential Library. That was the Air Force One in the background. There was one particular line from her speech that drew a standing ovation from the crowd there. Here's what she said. We have to choose because Republicans cannot both be loyal to Donald Trump and loyal to the Constitution. I think, John, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we have to be measured in how we view the impact of those words because California Republicans and the GOP nationally often feel like two very different groups of people. I think it's fair to say that the uh, people at the Reagan Library generally uh, represent a, a Republican establishment that uh, Donald Trump went to, to go take down, uh, even using uh, Ronald Reagan's slogan from uh, the 1980 campaign, Make America Great Again, 
Uh, but Trump, uh, Trump represents a very different Republican Party than the one uh, Ronald Reagan represented. Um, you know, interesting, she's got those words behind her, A Time for Choosing, that's the name of this series of speeches that uh, prominent Republicans are giving at the Reagan Library these days, many of them uh, potential 2024 uh, presidential hopefuls. And uh, of course, there's a lot of speculation that Congresswoman Cheney might her herself throw her hat in the ring. Yeah, I wonder about that and some of the political messaging that's going to, that's going to come from here. I mean, California's Republican Party is not as emboldened as Republicans elsewhere. California is a solidly blue state that has in some ways gotten bluer as the years have gone on. You know, Democrats in the state government have gone from a majority to a supermajority. Meanwhile, you've got President Biden who says he's planning to give a political speech once the investigation's work is over. Not unexpected, right? He would make some kind of statement or, or something like that. But what's the impact of all of this, you know, speechifying and politicking going into 2022 and 24? Well, for Biden, there's been all this discussion outside the White House that he might not run for president. Of course, inside the White House, the discussion is that he is running for president. And he's apparently, according to some of the reporting uh, we've read recently, uh, pretty upset that, that a lot of people think he's not going to run. Um, you know, he ran the first time uh, basically because of the Trump era, because of what he saw as the, um, you know, as the failures and, and the, the meanness and the incivility of the Trump era. And so I think every time he has an opportunity uh, to make that contrast, it's one uh, that he's going to, to take. Um, it makes him look both uh, presidential and at the same time political. And uh, that's an opportunity you rarely get as president of the United States to be able to do both at once. And before I have to let you go, I wonder where you think this goes from here. I mean, there was a new poll that found that just under half of all Americans say they think that the former president should be charged with a crime of some sort. Granted, these hearings are not a prosecution, though they are certainly laying out some very damning evidence. What is next for the committee? Uh, the committee's got a couple more hearings uh, that they've uh, announced that they're going to do. I don't know if there'll be more than two more. There's uh, but pr presumably um, when they come back from, from break in, uh, in a few weeks. And then eventually they'll write a report. Um, that, that report will have all of the details of these bombshells that we've heard in the hearings and probably a lot more. And uh, I think their hope is to lay out uh, not only breadcrumbs, but some pretty, some pretty strong encouragement to the Justice Department to make prosecutions. And whether that uh, rises to the level of former President Trump or not is something only uh, the Justice Department will be able to answer, but I would be shocked if there are not further prosecutions based on the evidence that we have seen uh, just publicly from this committee. All right. Thank you, John. That's NBC senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. Still to come, the end of Roe v. Wade might persuade the president to support a major change in Congress, getting rid of the filibuster. You'll hear his reason why. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Abortion may be a black and white issue for you, but the laws in the U.S. have lots of shades of gray tonight. States are figuring things out in lower courts after the Supreme Court's ruling, and President Biden says he wants to take action in Washington. Today, he said he supports writing Roe's protections into federal law, even if it means changing the Senate filibuster. And I believe we have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law and the way to do that is to make sure the Congress votes to do that. And if the filibuster gets in the way, it's like voting rights, it should be, we provide an exception for this, for the, except the, require an exception to the filibuster for this action. Meanwhile, courts are ruling on lawsuits, mainly filed by pro-abortion rights groups. Judges in Kentucky and Florida have temporarily blocked trigger laws that would ban abortion. We saw similar rulings this week in Texas, Utah, and Louisiana. How long will these legal battles go on? What does this mean for patients and providers and lawmakers? And in the meantime, how do we think through these legal gray areas? Joining us now is law professor Rachel Reboucher, the interim dean of Temple University's Beasley School of Law in Philadelphia. Dean Reboucher, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Let me start with one of the key issues perhaps the key issue that came up in Dobbs v. Jackson that has to do with privacy, or one of the key issues anyway. Florida's ruling in the measure that's been held temporarily 
says that its abortion ban is unconstitutional because Florida's constitution has a privacy provision within it and it violates that provision. Talk, us, talk to us a little bit more about what the law says about privacy, especially the difference between how we interpret the constitution, the U.S. constitution, and how states interpret their own constitutions. So this is an important issue for understanding what the post Dobbs, post Roe country is going to look like. Every state has a constitution that has principles like privacy, bodily autonomy, equality in those constitutions, and how those states have interpreted the right to privacy, such as in Florida, depends on the state Supreme Court and other courts in the state that have interpreted those provisions over time, interpreted them differently than the Supreme Court has interpreted our federal constitution. So you'll see these lawsuits continue because in each state, there's going to be a new question of whether or not a ban, some of the most strict bans, violate those principles of state constitutional freedoms like privacy or bodily autonomy. And I just want to be clear, you know, the, the, if a state has something written in that violates federal law, federal law has supremacy. So I presume right. we're not talking about like a state constitution saying, you know, to hell with you, Supreme Court. We believe that this needs to be there. Like they still have to be subject to the body of federal law, including Supreme Court precedent. Right. So that's 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 why these lawsuits uh, have been filed in the way they they have been filed. So a state constitution can go beyond the federal constitution. It can grant more rights to its state citizens than the federal constitution does. But you're right. A state constitution can't say, we're ignoring federal free speech. Um, but that's not what's happening here. Here, these are lawsuits based on state constitutional provisions that have been interpreted to provide probably more robust rights to privacy or bodily uh, autonomy. That's the case in Kentucky, another law that's a uh, ban that's been enjoined. And that's perfectly okay because these litigants are going to state courts asking state judges to apply state law. And we have doctrines like abstention, other doctrines that, that say, you know, th those aren't matters for federal courts or, or, or the federal government to decide. Those are state-based claims. So they, they, they don't implicate uh, preemption, you know, treading on federal right. supremacy, federal law that applies. There are a number of states who are proposing or have passed laws that would prevent uh, people from going state to state to get abortion services if they are residents of the state in which the law is written, particularly minors. I wonder how you see the law there, although I also wonder if it makes a difference if we're talking about a minor or an adult in terms of how this law is applied? It's a great question because we have a longer history of trying to prevent minors from leaving states. Uh, Missouri, for instance, in 2007 passed a law that was struck down that tried to keep minors from leaving so they could circumvent or get around uh, person, uh, parental consent rules. Um, but these, these laws are going to be increasingly popular. Uh, this week, we've already seen states starting to talk about how to pass them, model legislation that, as you say, targets minors who would leave the state in order to seek an abortion that's legal elsewhere. It's not clear that these laws would be constitutional. Missouri flirted with one last spring and uh, ended up not passing it, but the idea would have been that Missouri would have tried to punish a provider providing an abortion in a state where it's legal to do so if they provided an abortion for a Missouri resident. Uh, there's, right. There are problems with that. <laughs> I wonder, I know i got to let you go in just a second, but you wrote a New York Times uh, guest essay about the use of medical abortion pills in a post row world and you talked about how these would keep abortion access accessible for people, but there would be steps needed to increase access and distribution. Before I got to let you go, how do you contemplate the future of those pills, particularly because they are FDA approved? So there is some kind of federal law that governs the use of those medications that might perhaps maybe supersede state law, although I don't know if states can make carve outs or exceptions. H how do we think that through before we go? 
Another tricky issue, it's the argument that because the FDA has regulated medication abortion so closely and for so long, for decades, determining that it's safe, effective under certain conditions, that if states act to ban an FDA-approved drug, they can't do that, that they are preempted from doing that because, just as you mentioned, the federal law has already spoken on the issue, and this is a that would be the FDA regulation. So that would be a lawsuit in which um, the drug manufacturer, as it's doing in Mississippi, argues that if Mississippi tries to take an FDA drug out of the market or heavily regulate it in a way that the FDA hasn't done, um, that contradicts the FDA's purpose to set a uniform drug policy and to vet the safety of drugs as they enter the market. And if that were to happen, if it were to happen across the country, well, then states that ban abortion would have to make an exception for medication abortion because FDA rules abortion through 10 weeks via pills uh, would, uh, would carry the day. Rachel Rebouchet, the interim dean of Temple University's Beasley School of Law in Philadelphia. Dean Rebouchet, thank you very much for helping us think through this. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including human, including federal charges over dozens of migrants found dead in a tractor trailer, and the latest from Kyiv on a victory for Ukraine. Tonight's headlines begin with the deadliest known human smuggling incident in U.S. history. Four men now face federal charges after the deaths of 53 migrants. They were trapped inside an abandoned big rig in Eagle Pass, Texas, just outside San Antonio. Two of the men face smuggling charges. NBC's Guad Venegas has more. New details revealed today by the Department of Justice in the investigation of the 53, at least 53 people uh, dead after being transported in a tractor trailer here in San Antonio. We now know that the suspect driver, the suspected driver of that truck appeared in court today. Uh, Hector Zamorano, Homero Zamorano, that is, uh, has been charged uh, with alien smuggling resulting in death. If convicted, he could face life in prison or the death penalty. Now, investigators used a cell phone that they found on him uh, to find a person he was communicating with through text messages. That's Cristian Martinez, uh, who's also been charged with conspiracy of transporting uh, illegal aliens resulting in death. He could also face life in prison um, or the death penalty. Uh, additionally, we know that two other individuals have been detained. Now, these individuals uh, were in the U.S. with what authorities say were overstayed visas from, uh, they are Mexican, and they stayed uh, after their visas had expired. Um, they were detained with the possession of a firearm, so they're being charged as an uh, illegal individual in the country uh, possessing a firearm, not in connection directly to the deaths of the individuals in that tractor trailer. Now, we also know that of those that have been taken to hospitals, uh, 10 would still be remaining in different hospitals in the San Antonio area. Uh, earlier today, a representative of the government of Honduras came to this makeshift memorial and told us that the number of people from Honduras who died in this incident has now been uh, moved up to five. Originally, they thought it was Four, but he said they found an additional ID, and today he did speak to the family of a woman whose ID was found uh, in that uh, cargo trailer. Uh, that is the latest uh, on the investigation uh, after 53 people, at least 53 people, uh, died after being transported in a tractor trailer here in San Antonio. Back to you. Thank you, Guad. That's NBC's Guad Venegas reporting from Eagle Pass, Texas. Today, Ukrainian forces made significant advances in the south of the country. They forced Russian troops to withdraw from Snake Island. That's a strategic outpost off the Black Sea. This comes as Russia ramps up shelling and bombing across Ukraine. NBC's Ali Aruzi has more from Kyiv. Uh, the Russians have now left uh, Snake Island, that very famous island on the Black Sea. They say it's a gesture of goodwill. The Russian Federation said that they want to show the United Nations that they're not blocking so-called green corridors to allow much-needed grain and other farm products 
uh, to leave the Black Sea and reach uh, places around the globe that are having shortages of grain. But the Ukrainians say that's simply not the case. They are saying that they shelled the Russians so heavily uh, with artillery, with rockets, that they were forced to escape in two speedboats uh, from that island. Uh, and that's why they're no longer there, which really is a huge embarrassment for the Russians. Only last week they were boasting about owning that island and having occupied it. But now the Ukrainians say that they have bombed a garrison there and air defense systems that belong to the Russians, and the Russians have just left it behind uh, with their tail between their legs. And Snake Island is, of course, a very strategic place on the Black Sea. It's along a very busy shipping line uh, where much of that grain and other products come and go. It also serves as very important air defenses there. So this will be very important for the Ukrainians to get back. It is also a symbol of resistance for the Ukrainians. There was the very famous uh, incident there when the Russian warship rocked up along the island, uh, giving the Ukrainian troops there a chance to leave. The Ukrainian soldiers on that island very famously used an expletive and told that ship where to go. They've even made stamps commemorating that moment. So this is a moment of embarrassment for the Russians and another victory, however small it may be, for the Ukrainians. But that island is right now not occupied. The Ukrainians are saying they're taking their time before they get back to Snake Island to avoid being shelled by the Russians in turn. Thank you, Ali. That was NBC's Ali Aruzi reporting from Kyiv. And hey, stay with us later tonight for an exclusive interview with Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky. He sat down with NBC chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel. Join us for our special report, A President at War. That's tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern here on NBC News Now. Meanwhile, President Biden left Madrid today after the NATO summit. And obviously, the war in Ukraine was the hottest topic there. Mr. Biden said the U.S. is prepared to boost its military response in Europe. Air, land and sea deployments will take place to deter Russian aggression. He also touted the strength of NATO and welcomed two new allies. Putin thought he could break the transatlantic alliance. He tried to weaken us. He expected our resolve to fracture. But he's getting exactly what he did not want. We're more united than ever. And with the addition of Finland and Sweden, we'll be stronger than ever. They have serious militaries, both of them. We're going to increase the NATO border by 800 miles along the Finnish-Russian border. Sweden is all in. Coming up, Fourth of July travel could be tough for many people with disabilities. A new effort is creating space to practice being a passenger. You'll meet a mother and son who tried it out just ahead. Stay close. Flying in the U.S. can be stressful, perhaps more now than ever, and of course with Fourth of July weekend coming up. AAA estimates that three and a half million people will fly this weekend. They might find wait times longer than usual because staff shortages could cause some major delays. Packed planes and flight interruptions can be a nightmare, including for people with sensory or physical disabilities. According to the U.S. Bureau of Travel Statistics, more than 25 million Americans have disabilities that limit how they travel. More than half are adults younger than retirement age. What might make taking these flights easier? Perhaps it just takes some practice. Now travelers are getting that in a new mock airplane cabin at Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport. It has seats, windows, and bathrooms, and it's designed for people in wheelchairs, travelers with autism, people with service animals, even folks with a fear of flying. Joining us now are Cassandra Welsh, her son Remy, and her mother Jill Body. Good to have all of you with us tonight. And Cassandra, let me just start with you. Talk about some of the challenges that your family faces when you're trying to board an airplane with passengers like me who have no idea that you're struggling to try to kind of manage the flight. What is it normally like for you? Well, this will be our first flight, so we haven't really had experience with uh, trying to board with a, with a child with special needs before. Um, 
We know that we need to be careful about the noises around him. He's very sensitive to loud, unexpected noises. And the crowds are a little bit overwhelming. He doesn't understand about waiting, a very hard concept. So it's going to be a lot of just trying to keep him entertained while we wait. Um, and we're not sure how it's go he's going to do, but this um, program was great to let us uh, let him see what going to an airport and going through TSA, going into an airplane, all those things. It was a great opportunity just to try and give him a little bit of an introduction to what might be going on. Cassandra, as we have this conversation, please let me know if my tone is too loud or too too voluminous for Remy. I can certainly tone it down. I want to make sure everybody is uncomfortable. Everybody is comfortable as we have this conversation. Would you describe for me, yeah. please, Cassandra, what it was that happened? Was there somebody who walked you through it? Did they just kind of let you wander around on your own, kind of do your own thing? What was the procedure like? Um, we were greeted at the information while well, we had to go park in the parking lot, which was, um, they comped us for our parking, which was amazing. Um, and then we went to the information booth where we met a TSA um, officer and a volunteer. And the TSA officer and the volunteer walked us through the TSA process. They told us um, we went through the metal detectors and... Um, because uh, I went to the metal detectors. Right. For the children, they don't have to necessarily go through the metal detector. They can um, walk around and then just test their hands with the uh, explosive testing papers that they have. Um, we were able to, once we got through TSA, we were able to go to the mock airplane and board the airplane um, and sit down and buckle up inside that airplane um there was a, a pretend bathroom so i was able to show him you know how small it is what it looks like when you close the door where the sink would be where the toilet would be um and the the volunteer was the one who kind of walked us through what um the boarding process would look like who we could call beforehand as well as far as um who will help us on the day of when we actually fly. There are two different um, groups of people that could possibly help. Um, and they explained, they gave some great hints and tips about um, what we could do to... And, um, me and, and I bought my own suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> to prepare our children. You your own suitcase. Yeah. Yeah. So they gave That's us great. Hints, I, like, don't, I don't always pack my own suitcase, Remy. Sometimes I need help with my suitcase. But if you packed your own, <laughs> that is very, very cool. Cassandra, I'm sorry. Do you mind if I ask Remy a question? Would that be all right? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Hey, Remy, buddy, may, may I ask you a question? Yes. Do you feel ready to get on an airplane now? Yes. Yes. What makes you feel ready to get on an airplane? What will you do when you get on the plane? Plane, we flood boats and toys. We brought his uh, leapfrog toys? in his book, so he wants to do his leapfrog and his toys while we're flying. Very cool. I like that. That I, I always need toys are good to have on an airplane they help to kind of mm -hmm. keep me calm they make the flight go faster that's very smart buddy that's very smart for you cassandra and, I, I imagine that things like and, oh go ahead uh, go ahead remy go ahead uh, and they have and they have stuff to have make sure we have our toys on stuff oh he's talking about i showed him there were lap trays for him to put his <laughs> toys on <laughs> Yeah, so that you can lay out all your toys and you can have them right where you need them. That's perfect. That sounds like you're ready to go. And Cassandra, I'm... Yes. holder for cars. <laughs> a cup holder for cars. <laughs> I saw See, one cup holder. I thought I was the only one who put cars in my cup holder. I knew there was somebody else. I knew there was somebody else. Remy, let me ask your mom one more question before I have to let you go. Hold on just one second, buddy. Cassandra, could I just ask you for other passengers who 
may get on a plane, have no idea, because we don't know, right? We don't know what other people are dealing with around us in public spaces. And we can assume it is all about us on an airplane, and we want what we want immediately. What would you like passengers to keep in mind when they're traveling this summer, not knowing if a sweet kid like yours is going to be in the seat nearby? Just kind of keep in mind, like you were saying, everybody has their own something. Um, and so the kid that's kicking the back of your seat might be doing that because they can't sit still or because it physically hurts them to sit still or whatever. Um, and, and just try and keep those things in the back of your mind that they're not trying to be annoying, you know? And if you can, just try to ignore it or... If you have an idea or something that might help, you can ask a parent, you know, I've got this. Would that be helpful? Yeah. You know, mom, did you have anything you yeah. wanted to? You're doing good. I'm good. <laughs> My mom's been that was a great, great help. She's been on the, the program. Um, she's the reason why we got on the plane because I didn't know anything about it, but she had um, read an article. Was yeah, it? I think I read an article that said that it was available. Good, good. Well, Cassandra, Remy, Ms. Body, I really appreciate y'all making time for us tonight. Happy trails, safe travels, enjoy your first flight. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, buddy. Astronauts can reach the moon, but what about living there? Some new technology is getting us closer to lunar living. Part two of our series on NASA's Artemis project. Before we go. Before we go tonight, two stories on the frontiers of science. Last night, we brought you part one of our series on Artemis, NASA's mission to put astronauts back on the moon. But the mission is just one step in getting humans much farther into space. But how do we stay up there longer? Can we harvest resources on the moon and bring them back to Earth? And how do you build the infrastructure necessary for cities or settlements on the moon? NASA is working on those problems in its Swamp Works lab, and the answers are getting closer every day. Where do we come from? Are we alone? These are fundamental questions. Uh, if we answer those, we can map our future. We can have a good strategy. We can protect ourselves. We can understand our place in the universe. These are fundamental questions. And we will start to answer those when we go to the moon and Mars. But first, we have to test the technologies. This lab that you're looking at now is called the Swamp Works. It's an innovation environment. If you want to go into space, you have to be innovative. You, you can't use the same methods as you've used it before. And the technology is constantly evolving. It's constantly getting better. Dust has been identified as one of the top two impediments to long duration human space exploration for the moon. The other one is obviously radiation effects. The surface appears to be very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. It is a significant problem. The dust is very small, very fine particles. It's toxic. It gets into the joints and moving parts of all the mechanisms. For the Apollo mission, many of the mechanisms were rendered unusable after three days of exposure. So we've been developing our electrodynamic dust shield technology for 20 years or so. It's a technology demonstration of active dust removal. You push a button and the dust removes from a surface. And what I'm going to do is, if I have a glass surface that's coated with dust, I'm going to turn on my EDS and I'm going to watch the dust remove from the surface. So they can be made quite large. Roughly the same amount of power as what you just saw there, we can actually remove dust from a floor mat essentially. And that's our goal, is to try to get as many EDSs on the surface of the moon as possible so that humans don't have to spend time clearing surfaces, they don't have to time brushing off their suits or kicking off their boots or spending a lot of time trying to wipe their visors. When Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, he said, magnificent desolation. It looks like that, but if you go into the dirt, into the lunar soil, which we call regolith, it's crushed rock. And in the crushed rock, we have minerals. And in the minerals, we have elements. And we have a lot of resources there. If you pick up a bucket of dirt on the moon, 42% of that bucket is oxygen. 
We are developing excavation technologies to be able to excavate the regolith, which has the resources in it, so then we can send it to processing plants to extract all those resources. Currently, we have a mission that's right now scheduled for FY26. We're actually going up there to collect 10 metric tons of regolith and deliver it to just a simple area that we're gonna pile it up at just to prove that we are able to actually excavate on the moon. The one behind me is Razor 2. It's the second generation of this concept. This robot here doesn't look like any other type of excavation system that you've probably ever seen. Excavators here on Earth use the weight of their vehicle to react their excavation forces. When you go on the moon, now you're one-sixth the weight that you are here on Earth, so you don't have the reaction force anymore. So we came up with an idea utilizing these bucket drum technologies and the excavation forces from one counteracts the excavation forces from the other side so now we're not reliant on the weight of the vehicle to provide that reaction force like you would here on earth some of the other areas that we're working on beyond just excavation is construction we have current projects right now utilizing 3d printing technology we can actually print full roads if we wanted to if we could print repair parts for our robots what we're trying to do is prove out technologies that we can use to build large-scale structures on the lunar surface using local resources as much as possible. A lot of work is being done to center regolith, which is essentially melting the regolith so that it forms a solid structure. This is basalt fiber. It's like basically fiberglass or carbon fiber, but it's made out of rock. We're learning to 3D print large-scale infrastructure. One of the hazards that we have to face on the lunar surface is radiation. So one of the ideas is that we can create this protective structure by 3D printing a large arch and then covering that with regolith so that all of the radiation exposure would be basically mitigated. In my mind, the very first sustainable presence on the moon is gonna be more like an outpost or a camp. And so you'll probably use bulk regolith infrastructure to build things like berms and compacted roads and level surfaces. But then as time goes on, NASA and commercial industry will start building up their technologies, will start to build up markets there, and it will start to look a little bit closer like a city or a, a larger scale uh, community like we have on Earth. We'd love to run space station as long as we can, and, and we've got support to, to continue to operate space station until the 2030s. But however, it's an aging system, and, and we're starting to see the commercial evolution in low Earth orbit. Gateway takes advantage of what we've learned in space station. We're going to have what we call a gateway, which is, think of that as a small space station in lunar orbit. With a gateway, it's going to be quite a bit further away. It's about 240,000 miles away as opposed to, you know, 200 or so. Gateway represents an orbiting platform that goes around the moon. We can now learn to live longer in a different environment, a different radiation environment, a longer trip from home. The emergency situation changes. If we can expand that and bring that out to the moon, now we have the opportunity to access all the different locations of the moon and really start to set the stage for a deep space transportation that'll bring us to Mars. We have a science region of interest and a resource region of interest. And for the resources, we're trying to extract resources to survive and, and build a, a local economy. And for science, we're trying to expand the state of knowledge so we can understand our whole solar system and how it relates back to Earth. What is our place in the solar system? How does our planet evolve? And, and how can we keep our planet healthy and safe? We're the research and development leg for the American public. So we are always stretching the boundaries of what is possible. That's the point, because our investment in what NASA does has tremendous returns back to expanding the minds of our children to understand what's possible, you know, pushing the technology here on Earth to make our lives easier and finding ways to take care of what we have. That's the whole point. But at its heart, I, I really think it's about the, the nature of people to, to want to explore, want to find out what's out there. And, you know, I think there'll be huge benefits to, to all of humanity for doing that. There is some remarkable science going on right now to shape our future and also to understand our past. New research is focused on fossils of early human ancestors found in South African caves. Scientists now think they are older than previously suspected. A million years older. What does that mean for our understanding of human evolution? NBC's Isa Gutierrez has more on a new technique for dating fossils. 
This week, a shocking discovery. Could the origin of human life be much older than first thought? Researchers announcing fossils of early humans found in a South African cave are now believed to be about three and a half million years old. That's approximately a million years older than experts previously estimated. My first reaction was disbelief. Daryl Granger led the research team that made the astonishing discovery, publishing the findings in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal. I went back and made sure double sure, triple sure that everything I did was right because it was hard to believe that the fossils were really this old. The ancient fossils discovered 30 miles northwest of Johannesburg in the Sturkfontein Caves. The caves the hominin fossils were found in are part of the so-called Cradle of Humankind, a site known for its large concentration of these kinds of fossils. Hominins include humans and our ancestral relatives, but not the other great apes. We had to make an airtight case for this age because it is so different from the previous examples. The fossils older than Ethiopia's renowned Lucy or Dinkanesh fossil discovered in 1974 that dated back to 3.2 million years. This discovery reigniting the debate on the origins of modern humans. It is just amazing that everything is coming together and in some ways it vindicates my earlier work at Sturkfontein where we've been arguing for an older age for the deeper fossils at Sturkfontein for a long time. So in that way it feels like a, a major accomplishment. That was NBC's Isa Gutierrez reporting. Hey, thank you for making time for us. Remember, Richard Engel's interview with Ukraine's President Zelensky is tonight at 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific. Stay in touch with us. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can always leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail on any of the stories we cover, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.